I also would like to thank the Institute of International and European Affairs for the uh, invitation to say something about the water management in uh, the Netherlands. Um, I'm Marco Erkens and I advise uh, the Minister of Infrastructure and Environment in the Netherlands. I guess you all know the series uh, Yes Minister, well, that kind of uh, person. Uh, I want to tell you about the risks for the Netherlands for in, uh, in terms of water management, uh, the way we are organized and the responsibilities for the governance. Uh, then I zoom in on the water boards, a special form of government in the Netherlands. I tell you something about the Delta program and then I will end with some uh, <coughs> obvious conclusions. First, the Netherlands. The Netherlands are wetlands. Okay. Yes. A wetlands, uh, a very flat country uh, located near the sea, uh, and there are some great rivers from the Alps flowing uh, into the North Sea. We are a small country, about uh, 41,000 square kilometer, and uh, we are part of the catchment areas of the rivers, the Ems, the Rhine, uh, the Meuse, and the Scheldt. The total area of 41,000, oh, back. Yeah. The total area of 41,000 square kilometers is divided in 70% uh, uh, water, 58% uh, agriculture, 14% uh, is uh, urban area, and 11% uh, is nature and woodland. Uh, and as you can see on the map, uh, over 30% is located below sea level, and nearly 60% of the country is vulnerable to flooding. We have a population of nearly 70 million people, uh, and it is one of the highest densities, na national densities in, uh, in the world, other than uh, Ireland, I just heard. Um, and all these people and all this capital, the buildings, they are mostly concentrated on the western part of the land. So you can see it's rather stupid to, uh, yeah, to go live uh, in, in the parts that are uh, below sea level. And, uh, of course, it's because of the economic benefits the water brings us. But also, there are risks, and uh, we countered the risks. Um, there were a few times we had fleeting, but especially the fleeting in uh, 1953, uh, we remember always in the history. It did go wrong in the north west, uh, the southwest of the Netherlands, and uh, there was a big, uh, big flood in February 1953, and there were uh, 1,836 people killed. This flood was due to a combination of a heavy storm and high tide, uh, but the sea is not the only risk for the Netherlands. The climate change influences the amount of water in the streets and the rivers. And, uh, these pictures must be familiar with you since a week or two. Um, the water, water amount in the streets is, uh, is also a high risk for the Netherlands. And the risks for the Netherlands are uh, confirmed only two months ago in the World Risk uh, Report. It's the index of the United Nations um, and the World Risk Reports reviews what are the chances of a disaster. A disaster, an extreme natural event like a hurricane or a flood, an earthquake or an, uh, a tsunami. And it also reviews how does the country cope with it. What are the adaptive uh, strategies? Um, how's the susceptibility, eh? the, the infrastructure, the housing conditions and the general economic framework? And how are the coping capacities? How is your medical service? How is your warning system? How are your disaster warnings uh, preparedness? 
And as you look at the index, you can see that the Netherlands are on the 12th place uh, of the countries with the highest exposure for that kind of risk. We are the highest listed European country. But when you take the vulnerability in account, and the vulnerability is the sum of uh, a lack of adaptation strategy, lack of coping capacities, and uh, the lack of, lack of uh, susceptibility, uh, we end at the uh, 69th place. So you can say we do, uh, we do very well. Also checked Ireland, you're doing fine with the uh, 122nd place. Here is a map where you can see global how the risks are divided. Um, and when you zoom in on Europe, it's a bit unsharp, but then you can see here the Netherlands as the only country with a very high uh, risk. You also see Greek with a high risk, but yeah, we all know the risks of Greece uh, at the time. <laughs> and Ireland has a medium uh, risk. So now we've seen the risk for the Netherlands, and then we cope well. And uh, in this presentation, I will focus on the governmental side of it. But first, some facts. Where are we talking about? The Netherlands. We have 3,400 kilometers of primary dikes, 70,000 kilometers of other dikes, uh, 57 kilometers of main local and regional water courses. 390 wastewater treatment plants. 99% uh, of the enterprises and households have a, a sewage connection. And there is 22 million water pollution equivalents treated. The total costs altogether uh, is 7 billion euros. And the average price the household pays to the water boards is 285 euro. Uh, that is only what the household is paying to the water board. It is not for drinking water. Drinking water in the Netherlands is, uh, we have about five enterprises uh, and they provide the drinking water and you pay for the amount of drinking water you take. And it is also not for the taxes from the uh, central government uh, they are used for uh, the water management. But 285 euros as an average household tax for the water boards, uh, you get uh, dry, dry feed, you get enough water, you get uh, good quality water in, in, uh, in the land. And it's, an, uh, it's a price, uh, well, most uh, households pay something like that for their internet uh, connection. I mentioned earlier the 1953 disaster in the Netherlands. Um, but since then, we did not have anyone die as a consequ direct consequence of, uh, of fleeting. And that's something we are proud of. Um, so many kilometer dikes, high risks, no more deceased, what's the success? There are several success factors. Um, for instance, we have the University of Delft, we have a high level of engineering, uh, we have a long history, history in engineering and fighting against uh, the water, but today I will just focus on the way we organize it uh, by government. And by government, we have uh, three different levels of organization, the water management. Three different levels with four um, governments. The two governments on the regional and local level, and I'll now focus in on the responsibilities and the tasks of them. At the national level, the national government is responsible for the construction and the maintenance of the dunes along the coast um, and for some big structures like the Maesland storm surge barrier uh, to keep the water out of the sea. 
the national government is also responsible for the construction of crucial dikes and dams along the primary waterways, but the maintenance of those dikes and dams are the responsibility for the water boards. Then we have the 12 provinces, and their water management tasks are integrated spatial planning at the regional level, setting regional and environmental standards and objectives, and they also have the supervision of the water boards and the municipalities. And those areas are different from the water boards. You will just see, but first, the 480 municipalities. In general, the municipality is responsible for uh, yeah, all the aspects, the local aspects in the municipality. You can think of uh, uh, zoning, uh, infrastructure, infrastructure uh, sports culture, and other local issues. But especially for the water, they are responsible for the sewer average, the transport of the wastewater to the wastewater treatment plant, and for the surface water quantity, but only within the boundaries of the municipality. And then the water boards. The water boards is a very special, uh, unique form of government we have in the Netherlands, and we call it a functional government. And what's special about it, it's, it's a government that is only legal tasks for water management. Uh, they are responsible for um, flood protection, surface water quantity, surface water quality, uh, for the urban wastewater treatment, the groundwater management, all legal tasks, especially with, within the water boards. And they have, therefore, they have uh, specific instruments. They have an own board. They have own elections. They have own legal power. And very important, an own tax system. And the boundaries are not the same as the provinces. Uh, you can say with 12 provinces, 25 water boards, but they all have different boundaries, and the boundaries for the water boards are water related. More characteristics, characteristics of the water boards. It's a, it's a functional government. It's a, a demo, democracy of interests. And we uh, acknowledge four different categories of interests. First, the civilians, a very important category uh, are the civilians. It's for the water trees, what, wastewater treatment plants uh, to get enough water in, in the uh, the canals in the cities, uh, very important, but also the agriculture category. Uh, more specific, not, not built, the, the grounds that are not built, but mostly it is agriculture. It's another uh, interest. The third interest is uh, all the grounds, the buildings, and the fourth is uh, nature. And those four kinds, four categories of interest, uh, we see back in the, in the board of the water board. They have a say in the decision, but also they pay the taxes. And there are two, tax two taxes. Uh, one is for uh, the wastewater treatment, and there you pay according to the emission. And the second tax is, well, for the water system, all the other costs that a water board makes. Um, and you pay, every category pays due to the uh, amount of interests they have in uh, the work of the water boards. And very important is, with the special tax for the water boards, that there is no possibility for trade-off. Um, there's no government that says, well, uh, this year I want to spend some more uh, on uh, uh, education, or social welfare, or culture, or infrastructure. No, we have a special government with a legal task, water management. They can uh, collect taxes for it, and so there's always enough money to do what is necessary to keep the feet dry, have enough water, and have good water. We have a long history with the water boards. 
already in the 11th century, uh, landowners set together to cooperate to prevent the land from fleeting. And the birth of league regional water boards was in 1232. Uh, it was not only against fleeting, it was also to keep your land dry. As you just saw on the map, you're very, uh, very low. There's a lot of water. And when you want to agriculture the land, you have to uh, manage the water amount. And since those centuries, we've developed. Um, they worked more together. And as we can see, in 1970, we had the Surface Pollution Water Act. So the aim of the water boards was not only um, protection against floods, but also the quality <coughs> of the water. And then you see that a lot of water boards, some were only for the wastewater, some were only for the flood protection, some were only for the amount of water in the, in the land, and they merged. And nowadays we have 25 water boards in the country. And uh, well, that's not yet the minimum. So a very important success factor for the Netherlands is the Institute of Water Boards, but there's more. We also uh, think it's important to look in the future, to be prepared at what's coming in the future. And it's also very important to uh, involve all the parties. After the disaster in 1953, we had an, uh, a Delta committee. Um, and the advice of that Delta committee led to uh, great structures in the southwest of the Netherlands. And uh, in uh, 2008, we had uh, the second Delta committee. So it's not something you do every year. You wait a while, uh, but then you, you have something. And uh, the Delta committee in 2008 said the threat is not acute, but it is very urgent that the flood risk management and the fresh water supply be dealt with. And they recommended uh, to make a Delta program, uh, to make a Delta Act, to have a special Delta fund, and to have a Delta director. The Delta program, it's just made, and uh, the goals are, the, their goal, goals are um, to manage the flood risk and the fresh water, water supply. And in the process, it must be a decisive and integrated implementation. And we divide three generatic sub-programs, flood risk management, uh, new construction planning and restructuring, and a fresh water supply. That's for the whole country. Uh, you have to, it's, it's not the amount of water that is the problem, it's, it's the, uh, to have it on the right place, on the right time. And we have six regional sub-programs well, you can read them from the screen and in your slides. And to finish, I want to emphasize the interconnectivity of the Delta program. Uh, it is from water management, but where possible and necessary, it integrates with other policy areas. And in the process, the goal is to keep the coherence between national and regional decision making and all the relevant parties are involved in the Delta program. The conclusions for today I want to give to you is that, especially for a country located largely below sea level and otherwise flood-prone area, water management is a very important issue. The system with regional water boards has over the centuries proven to be a very good functioning system. It's democratically chosen with four categories of interests. They have own responsibilities and legal tasks and an own financing, which, which secures the budget for water management independent of other political important issues. And the four categories of interests 
pay in relation to their interests. Furthermore, we have a long tradition of consulting structured in the Delta program, and we want to be prepared for the future, but no guarantees. Thank you very much.